Mondays were always a sore spot for me, and this particular Monday shaped up to be one of the worst in recent memory. My wife, Janet, seemed unusually distant and somber, going through the motions of fixing breakfast for our boys and me with a robotic efficiency. It wasn't that she was being intentionally unpleasant, just weighed down by a heavy sense of despondency that cast a shadow over the morning. I couldn't quite pinpoint the cause of her mood, nor did I feel particularly compelled to pry and ask. As my two sons, Dylan, aged 16, and Nathan, 18, headed off to school, I set out for another day of the freight company, where I had been employed for the past 15 years. Loading and unloading container ships was tough, demanding work, but it provided a steady income. It was a job that resonated with me, perhaps because it brought me as close to the sea as I could realistically get. My true passion lay in sailing the world, exploring distant shores, and meeting new people. But the responsibilities of home and family took precedence, a fact that I accepted with a mixture of contentment and resignation. Despite the allure of my maritime dreams, I cherished the stability and love that defy my life at home with my wife and two sons, even if it meant enduring another dreaded Monday. However, the real thorn in my side at work was the people I had to deal with, particularly Andrew Beverly, whose sheer obnoxiousness knew no bounds. He was invariably accompanied by his trio of cohorts from our high school days, Matthew Daniels, Alan Evans, and James Gilmore. I'd never cared for them back then, and my sentiments hadn't softened over the years. Hey Michael, missed you at the party Saturday night. Andrew's voice cut through the office, signaling the start of what promised to be another unpleasant encounter. Memories of the company party flooded back, the one I had missed because my sons and I had to assist my father in Chester, clearing out my childhood home after my mother's passing six months prior. Janet had been disappointed, but I encouraged her to attend without us. When we returned late Sunday, her nonchalant response about the party had left me feeling uneasy. I met Andrew's gaze with a steely glare, opting for silence instead of engaging in his provocations. But thanks for letting your wife grace us with her presence. She really made the night special, Andrew continued, his words dripping with insincerity, echoed by the laughter of his companions, who seemed to relish their private joke at my expense. Feeling my fists clench involuntarily, I fought to control my rising anger as Andrew persisted, trailing after me with his taunts. She's blossomed quite nicely since high school, hasn't she, Michael? You're a lucky man to come home to that every night. It was evident from the outset that the day was destined to be an arduous one. The tension coiled within me, manifesting in pulsating veins on my forehead and taut tendons in my neck. Controlling my temper had been a lifelong battle, and once again I endeavored to simply walk away. But Andrew, relentless as ever, had one last taunt in his arsenal. With a flick of his hand, he sent something hurtling toward me, a pair of red panties. Janet must have left these behind on Saturday, he jeered, his words punctuated by the uproarious laughter of his cohorts. I stood there, refusing to meet their gaze, as the silk fabric landed at my feet, abandoned and disregarded. My breath caught in my chest, my stomach muscles coiling with tension. Anger simmered beneath the surface, threatening to erupt like a volcano. I knew I could take any one of them in a fight but facing them all at once presented a formidable challenge. At that moment, however, consequences mattered little to me. I began to advance toward my tormentors when a firm grip seized my shoulder. Paul Rayleigh, the dock foreman, locked eyes with me and wordlessly motioned toward the main office. No words were exchanged as I shot a searing glare at the group, a gaze brimming with a hatred they had never before witnessed. Reluctantly, I followed Paul up the stairs, noting the sudden shift in demeanor among my antagonizers, laughter replaced by apprehension. Inside Denzel Morgan's office, I took a seat across from his secretary, Camilla, as Paul engaged in conversation with his superior. Michael, would you like a cup of coffee? Camilla offered. No, thanks. I'm too upset to hold a cup right now, I replied, my frustration palpable. Through the glass partition, 
I could observe Paul and Denzel engrossed in what appeared to be a serious conversation. Camilla, were you at the party Saturday night? I inquired, seeking some clarity in the midst of confusion. She simply nodded in affirmation. Can you tell me what the hell happened? I have no idea what's going on. Janet didn't say anything, and I don't know what to do. I pleaded, desperate for answers. I shouldn't say anything, Michael. That's something you should discuss with your wife. Camilla deflected, her gaze shifting to the papers strewn across her desk as if searching for an escape. You were there, Camilla. You saw what happened. Just give me a clue, I pressed, sensing her reluctance to divulge any information. Please, Camilla, I need to know. Reluctantly, she began to speak, her voice tinged with discomfort. Janet arrived at the party looking stunning. Andrew wasted no time plying her with drinks. She seemed to be enjoying herself. Colin would whisper something to his cronies, and they would all share a laugh. Eventually, Janet and Andrew disappeared into the storeroom. Thirty minutes later, Matthew, Alan, and James followed suit. They were gone for an hour before re-emerging, laughing and joking. Janet had a smile on her face, but she looked disheveled, her hair and dress in disarray. She and Andrew left together about ten minutes later. Thanks, Camilla. I appreciate your honesty, even though it's difficult to hear, I said, acknowledging her disclosure. We sat in silence for another ten minutes before Paul emerged, signaling for me to enter Denzel's office. Michael, I'm not pleased with what transpired this morning. Andrew, Alan, Matthew and James have each been suspended for a week without pay. Additionally, I'm asking you to take a two-week vacation. Paul filled me in on what happened Saturday, and I assume this is news to you. I can't risk anyone ending up in the hospital. I don't hold you responsible for this, but I expect you to resolve things before returning. I'll provide any support you need through this. Now, get out of here, Denzel instructed sternly. I nodded my thanks to Denzel and expressed gratitude to Camilla once more as I left the office. Andrew and his cohorts were conspicuously absent as I made my way to the parking area, leaving the offending panties behind on the dock. Instead of heading home, I set off driving northward, seeking solace in a place where I could lose myself. With the road stretching ahead, I had ample time to reflect on the past and the present. Janet and I had been classmates in high school. She was never one to conform to societal standards of beauty her appearance often described as unpolished and unkempt. Yet it was precisely her nonconformity that drew me to her. Standing tall at six foot three and weighing close to three hundred pounds, I was hardly a picture of grace or attractiveness. Socially awkward and lacking in athletic prowess, I found solace in Janet's outsider status, a connection forged by our shared experiences of feeling out of place. Andrew Beverly was the antithesis of me. With his charm, athleticism, and good looks, he embodied everything I wasn't. Despite never having a steady girlfriend, Andrew never lacked for companionship. I loathed him, especially when he boasted about his conquests, seemingly oblivious to the feelings of those involved. Except for Janet. Janet had once tried to catch Andrew's eye, hoping to claim him as her first, but instead of a romantic tryst, she was met with rejection and humiliation. Andrew not only declined her advances, but also publicly ridiculed her, declaring that he only dated girls and wouldn't deign to associate with someone like her. While the rest of the school found amusement in his antics, Janet was left shattered. Seeing this as my opportunity to step in, I began to extend a hand of friendship to her. Without a clue on how to properly court a girl, I simply started being there for her. Before long, our friendship blossomed into something deeper, and by the time we graduated, we were a couple. After graduating, I landed a job as a construction laborer. Within a year, the excess weight melted away, replaced by solid muscle and newfound agility. It was a relief to shed the label of being the butt of jokes. Janet and I tied the knot shortly after, and before we knew it, Dylan and Nathan came into our lives in quick succession. Janet took to working out at a local gym, undergoing a remarkable transformation. Along the way, 
She mastered the art of styling her hair, applying makeup just right, and dressing to impress. She looked stunning, and I couldn't help but feel a swell of pride knowing she was my wife. I loved her when she was a diamond in the rough, and now she had blossomed into a true princess. Landing the job at the loading dock marked a turning point for us, propelling our lives in a positive direction until today. As I drove down the A14, which eventually merged into the A1, my destination loomed closer with each passing mile. Thoughts of my two sons filled my mind. They inherited the robust stature of our lineage and were a testament to it. We made sure they stayed active, determined to steer them away from the sedentary lifestyle we once led. Nathan stood a bit taller and leaner than Dylan, who boasted formidable hands and arms. Both were in peak physical condition, equipped to fend for themselves. We instilled in them the values of restraint and empathy, emphasizing the importance of avoiding bullying behavior. Their aspirations aligned with ours. They both harbored dreams of sailing the seas, a passion that seemed to course through our family's veins. I pledged to support them in whatever endeavors they pursued. Janet was the epitome of a devoted mother and an exceptional wife. She managed our household with precision and prudence, never squandering money on frivolities. From my perspective, we shared a blissful married life. As I continued my journey along the M6, the miles ticking away, the shadows lengthened, and I aimed to reach Port Patrick before nightfall. It was a seven-hour drive, but it was the only destination on my mind at that moment. After what felt like an eternity, I finally spotted the sign for the A-75 as the sun dipped below the horizon. There was an abundance of parking spaces, a perk of the season. Handing my keys to the bartender, I requested a week-long room rental. I had no luggage, no change of clothes, and no razor, but it didn't matter. He handed me the room key, hanging my car keys in the same spot, and I retreated to a secluded corner with a pint in hand. The amber glow of the streetlight filtered through the bottled glass window, casting a somber atmosphere. It was time to drown my sorrows and escape from reality. Mornings found me awakening in my room, a haze clouding my recollection of the previous night. Often, a local patron would assist me up the stairs, depositing me unceremoniously onto the bed, though I never managed to get under the sheets. I splashed water on my face and occasionally took a shower, although it did little to alleviate the pungent odor clinging to my clothes. The unchecked growth of a fear spirit was a stark reminder of my deteriorating state. Every few days, my credit card was swiped to settle the accumulating tab. I had wallowed in self-pity for far too long, and the realization of my stagnant existence was beginning to weigh heavily on me. I sat there, my gaze fixed on the dartboard, my mind clouded and unfocused. Two figures in uniform entered the pub, but I didn't bother acknowledging them directly. They exchanged words with the bartender, and his nod in my direction signaled their attention. Gesturing towards the keys hanging behind him, I assumed they were looking for me. In a moment of surprising lucidity, I pieced together their purpose without them uttering a word. They made no attempt to engage me in conversation. Instead, they simply filled me up with coffee for the next couple of hours. Michael, Michael Labert, can we have a word with you? One of them finally addressed me. Did I do something wrong? I replied, my voice heavy with resignation. We just need to talk. Are you up for it? The other officer asked. Can we step outside? I requested, seeking the clarity of fresh air. The sun shone brightly, but the remnants of recent rainfall left everything damp. The cobbled street leading to the pub's entrance was slick, and I navigated it cautiously. The incline of the street compounded the sensation of imbalance lingering from my earlier indulgence. Stepping onto the seawall, I welcomed the cool breeze filling my lungs, a refreshing contrast to the stale air inside. Though I didn't smoke, the density of the air indoors felt suffocating. Leaning over the granite barrier, I retched, expelling mostly liquid as a result of my scant solid food intake over the past few days. As my head began to clear, so did my vision. 
My two companions waited patiently as I collected myself, a growing sense of guilt nagging at me for inconveniencing them. The bench where I eventually seated myself was damp, but I hardly noticed. What can I assist you with, gentlemen? I inquired, eager to address their concerns. Firstly, we've been trying to locate you, as you've been missing for ten days. Secondly, we're attempting to track down Andrew Beverly, and we're hoping you could provide us with some assistance. Well, you've found me, so that part of the puzzle is solved. I haven't crossed paths with Andrew Beverly since my arrival here. As the barkeep likely informed you, I've remained within the confines of the inn since I checked in. I'm clueless about Andrew's whereabouts, but I reckon I'll be doing some searching once I return home, I explained to the officers. We conversed for another hour or so. They had no charges to lay against me, and after confirming my safety, their inquiry seemed solely fixated on Andrew. They traced my location through my credit card charges, a blunder I won't repeat if a similar situation arises in the future. After bidding them farewell, I descended the hill and purchased some fresh clothing and a toothbrush. Despite the unkempt appearance of my beard, I resolved to keep it for a while longer. Following a final shower, I settled my bill and commenced my journey homeward. Along the way, I made several stops mostly to procrastinate my return. There was nothing awaiting me at home that promised comfort or joy, but I did yearn to reunite with my boys. Upon arrival, I found Janet seated on the couch, bathed in the glow of a single light. Her hands lay still in her lap, her gaze fixed on me with a mixture of apprehension and sorrow. It appeared she had been crying, although the dim lighting made it difficult to discern. The notion of a beer made me queasy, so I opted for a Coke instead. I awaited her words, uncertain of what to expect. The boys are staying with friends tonight. I thought it would give us a chance to have some privacy and talk, she began tentatively. Why didn't you mention it before I found out? I probed, a mix of frustration and confusion in my tone. I don't know. I suppose I was afraid, she admitted hesitantly. Afraid of what? I pressed. I wasn't sure how you'd react. I did something foolish, and it didn't turn out as I hoped. She confessed, her voice tinged with regret. Foolish, what exactly happened? I demanded, my patience waning. Michael, please promise you won't get angry, she pleaded, her tone begging for understanding. I can't promise anything until I know the truth, but go ahead. Tell me, I relented, my voice stern yet tinged with apprehension. Do you remember what Andrew did to me in high school? She asked, her voice wavering with emotion. Yes, I replied, the memory still vivid in my mind. I've been wanting to get back at him for that ever since it happened. So on Saturday night at the party, I thought I saw an opportunity and set a trap for him. She confessed, her words heavy with remorse. That doesn't quite match up with the story I've heard, I remarked, my suspicion growing. Listen to me, Michael. Like I said, it backfired on me. I dressed up really nice, and Andrew started to hit on me. I let him think it was working, and he suggested we go back to the storeroom. We kissed a little because I had to do it to set him up. First we kissed, then I let myself be touched. Why did you do that? I asked, my frustration growing. I wanted to get even with him. I wanted to make him pay for humiliating me, so I told him to take off his pants. When he did, I started laughing at his small size. It was disgusting, but in this case, it felt appropriate. Go on, I urged, my voice tense. I gathered myself and made my way to the door to leave. Outside, Matthew, Alan, and James were waiting, as if Andrew had given them permission to have their turn after him. I passed them without a word and headed to the ladies' room, laughing inwardly at their audacity. When I returned to the party, they were all wearing smug smiles, having spread rumors about their supposed exploits with me in the pantry. It was their petty attempt at revenge for my embarrassing Andrew. Feeling upset, I decided to leave, she recounted, her voice tinged with frustration. I heard you left with Andrew. I interjected. That's not true. I left alone and drove straight home, she clarified. 
You left your panties there for Andrew, I prodded. No, I simply forgot them in my haste to leave, she admitted sheepishly. Why didn't you tell me any of this? I demanded, my voice tinged with hurt. After they twisted the truth, I was scared and unsure of what to say to you, she confessed, her voice barely above a whisper. So you allowed me to find out for myself in front of my colleagues. I felt like a fool, like a cuckold. They teased me about what supposedly happened, and I couldn't defend myself because I didn't know the truth. I had to piece together the story from a secretary, and even her version doesn't align perfectly with yours. I lamented, a bitter taste of betrayal lingering in my mouth. She wasn't there. I was. What I told you is what happened. Damn it. Michael, I'm your wife. You're supposed to stick up for me and support me. Janet exclaimed, her voice breaking as tears streamed down her cheeks. She retreated into the kitchen, her sobs echoing softly through the room. I sat there, sipping my coke, watching as Janet leaned against the formica table, her tears staining its surface. My love for her was unwavering. She was the only woman I had ever truly cared about, but her words felt like a facade, a desperate attempt to salvage our marriage. Camilla had no motive to deceive me. Despite the turmoil brewing within me, I resisted the urge to interrogate Janet about the inconsistencies in her story. Pressing her for the truth would only lead to more anguish, and it wouldn't change what had already transpired. I longed to uncover the truth, but I knew I wouldn't find it from her. So I chose to leave things unresolved, allowing Janet some semblance of peace. After another shower, I climbed into bed beside my wife. She nestled her head against my shoulder, whispering declarations of love, before we both succumbed to sleep. With a few days off before returning to work, I spent time with the boys, who greeted me with a mix of relief and reservation. I suggested a trip to London, which they eagerly accepted. Janet seemed pleased to witness the bonding between the men and her family. During the drive, the boys confessed to being suspended for fighting, a serious offense in our household. Reluctantly, they admitted to facing ridicule about their mother's escapade at the party, leading them to take matters into their own hands. They spared their mother the details but sought clarification from me regarding the events of that night. I deflected their inquiries for the time being, opting to delay the conversation. We made our way to the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, where I requested three applications, much to the boys' excitement. It took us about an hour to complete all the forms, ensuring we had all the necessary documents, such as birth records and passports. Following brief interviews for each of us, the agency provided medical forms to be filled out by a physician. We decided to treat ourselves to supper at Wagamama before heading home, agreeing to keep our plans discreet, refraining from informing Janet or their friends. The next day, we completed our physicals, leaving us with nothing to do but wait. Despite everything, I still harbored deep affection for Janet. She was the only woman I had ever truly loved, the only one I had ever been with, or even kissed. It was difficult for me to reconcile her actions with the person I thought I knew. I found her behavior reprehensible and unforgivable. Yet, I remained open to the possibility of giving her another chance, provided she could somehow substantiate her claims. However, the odds seemed stacked against her. As the week drew to a close, Janet's behavior took a surprising turn. She became increasingly attentive, making a conscious effort to avoid any mention of the party or my trip to Port Patrick. It was as if she was striving to return our life to its former state, oblivious to the rift that had formed between us. That night, Janet displayed an unusual curiosity in bed, and we shared an intimate and enjoyable evening together. She nestled beside me as we slept peacefully until morning. The following day during breakfast, I was blindsided by what I can only describe as the epitome of foolishness. Michael, I've been thinking. I'd like to have another baby, Janet announced. In that moment, the events of the previous night suddenly made sense to me. However, to fully grasp the absurdity of her statement, a bit of context is necessary. Janet had been on birth control pills for several years following the birth of our boys. 
approximately three years ago, she began experiencing side effects from the pills, which led her to discontinue using them. We hadn't employed any other form of birth control since then. Sometime later, during a visit to the doctor for a rotator cuff issue, I inquired about a vasectomy. Within 20 minutes, I underwent the procedure, rendering me sterile. I hadn't seen fit to disclose this to Janet. For the past three years, we'd engaged in unprotected intimacy without any discussion of why she couldn't conceive. Now out of the blue, she expressed a desire to miraculously conceive a child. Either she was incredibly naive, or she believed me to be exceptionally gullible. I regarded her with a mixture of astonishment and disbelief. I think that would be wonderful, honey, I replied, masking my inner turmoil with a supportive facade. As a man, I'm not well versed in matters of pregnancy, but given that it had been nearly three weeks since the party, there was a distinct possibility that Janet had missed a period and was attempting to cover her tracks. This revelation shed new light on the situation, prompting me to expedite my plans. With the boys back in school, I seized the opportunity to have a heart-to-heart -heart with them before they headed off. Surprisingly, they seemed to grasp the complexities of my situation with their mother better than I did. Knowing I had their unwavering support and understanding offered a glimmer of comfort amidst the uncertainty looming ahead. At this juncture, I remained unsure of what the future held. Throughout the day, I scored the town in search of Colin Beverly. He had to be somewhere. During lunchtime, I swung by the docks to catch up with Camilla. While Matthew, Allen, and James had returned to work, she remained clueless about Andrew's whereabouts. Rumors circulated that he feared my retaliation, a notion that baffled me, as I had always considered myself a peaceable individual. I made a conscious effort to avoid the work area, eager to steer clear of any encounters with my tormentors. Later that afternoon, I paid a visit to a local lawyer, initiating the paperwork necessary to dissolve my marriage to Janet. The decision weighed heavily on me. I had no desire to inflict pain upon her, but the prospect of continuing to live with her was untenable. With the boys on the cusp of independence, I saw no reason to remain tethered to a relationship that had soured irreparably. However, one lingering issue gnawed at me. The need to confront Andrew and his cohorts for their role in the demise of my marriage. While I acknowledged that Janet bore primary responsibility, I couldn't bring myself to confront her. Instead, her paramours would bear the brunt of their poor choices. James Gilmore, a married man, made it a habit to stop by McMurray's for a pint before heading home. As dusk settled, he emerged from the side door and began his walk along the building towards his car parked at the rear. Seizing the opportunity, I caught him off guard, grabbing his left arm and wrenching it behind his back. With force, I propelled him into the wall, the sound of impact echoing as his face collided with the brick surface. Despite his knees buckling under the pressure, I maintained my grip on his arm, raining down blows upon his kidneys with my right fist. Each strike elicited sickening cracks as ribs gave way beneath the assault. I continued the barrage until his arm went limp at the shoulder socket, at which point I released him, allowing him to crumple to the cobblestones just as a group of onlookers approached. Without a backward glance, I calmly made my way to my car and drove off into the night. Two hours later, I found myself seated in the police station, Janet having put her house up as collateral to secure my bail. Amidst the chaos, Maria Gilmore stormed in, demanding my incarceration for eternity. Though the authorities managed to restrain her, her tirade persisted until Janet intervened. I couldn't discern the contents of their conversation, but Maria's glare as she exited spoke volumes. Dylan and Nathan, having retrieved my car, silently chauffeured me home while Janet followed behind. Though the boys appeared to wear expressions of pride, I refrained from encouraging them with words or actions, mindful of the gravity of the situation. James suffered a dislocated shoulder, a broken nose, two black eyes, and numerous internal injuries, yet to be fully diagnosed. Fortunately, although four ribs were fractured, none had punctured his lungs. Upon returning home, 
My wife and I maintained a tense silence regarding the incident. For the first time in two decades, I opted to sleep on the couch, a minor inconvenience considering the gravity of the situation. The following morning, I rose early, grappling with the weight of uncertainty looming over my next course of action. Meanwhile, the Osakamaru was in the process of unloading at Felix Doe. Captain Hosokosta, known for his amiable demeanor, expressed his willingness to accommodate me should I obtain the necessary documentation. Promising to provide him with an update later in the week, I resolved to pursue this potential opportunity. As I made my way home, I decided to stop and refill the gas tank. Just as I completed the task, I noticed a figure rushing towards me. Before I could react, Alan Evans swung a 2x4 at my left side with force. The wood grazed my left arm before striking my ribs, causing searing pain to shoot through my body. I grimaced, struggling to catch my breath as the world blurred around me. Bright flashes erupted behind my closed eyelids as I felt my knees give way beneath me. The wooden club clattered against the asphalt as Alan lost his grip upon impact. Instinct took over as I fell, my right hand instinctively grasping onto fabric. Despite the agony coursing through my left side, I twisted my body to the left and drove my right fist, clenched around the fabric, into the ground. I landed heavily on top of Alan, my eyes squeezed shut against the pain radiating from my injured side. Unable to move my left arm, I relied solely on instinct as my right hand relentlessly pounded away. In a frenzy, I hammered down with my right hand, the blows landing on anything within reach, anything that wasn't the unforgiving asphalt. My body moved of its own accord. While my left side curled up defensively, my right side launched a relentless assault. Initially, Alan squirmed beneath me, attempting to break free, but soon his movements ceased. I continued to rain down blows until bystanders intervened, pulling me away from the motionless figure below. Gasping for air, each breath a dagger of pain, I struggled to comprehend the chaos that had just unfolded. A medic administered a shot, and I drifted into sleep as they transported me to the hospital. Hours later, I awoke to find my left arm in a sling my body securely taped, and each breath accompanied by a cautious ache. Janet's presence greeted me, her expression far from pleased. Michael, what on earth were you thinking? She began, causing such a commotion over that minor party incident. Sorry, honey. I didn't provoke anything. Why did your acquaintance attack me with a two-by-four? And don't downplay what happened as a little party problem. Either you provide a clear account of what transpired that Saturday, or I'll take further steps to uncover the truth. You're not seeking answers. You're resorting to violence. Janet retorted sharply before storming out. With a wry smile, I watched her leave, only for the doctor to enter the room shortly after. Thankfully, my injuries were more bruises than breaks. Alan's swing had been clumsy, my arm was sore, and the rib fracture superficial. The pain and difficulty breathing stemmed from the impact. The following morning, Dylan and Nathan arrived, their grins wide, but I cautioned them to curb their enthusiasm. Alan, however, fared far worse. His injuries would leave him reliant on a straw for sustenance for the next month, and it would be at least a week before the swelling in his face subsided. One stray blow had even fractured his left collarbone. Though in truth, all my strikes had been somewhat haphazard, given the chaotic circumstances. There were no legal repercussions for me, as several witnesses testified that Alan had initiated the attack. I had to call in sick to work again and extend my time off. During a conversation with Camilla, she informed me that Matthew had resigned from his position and his final paycheck was being forwarded to his brother's residence in Aberdeen. Andrew's whereabouts remained unknown. Communication between Janet and me had deteriorated further, and I found myself sleeping on the couch every night. While I quickly recovered from the need for the arm sling, my ribs remained tender. However, I was grateful to regain normal mobility and breathing. With the departure of the Osakamaru looming in four days, I visited my lawyer to ensure the divorce papers were in order. I instructed him to serve them in conjunction with my departure. 
everything would be left to Janet, including the house, which the bonding company would reclaim upon my inevitable bail jump. I felt indifferent about the material possessions. In preparation for my departure, I made arrangements with acquaintances in Scotland and dedicated time to the gym to recover from the assault. Denzel Clark reluctantly bid me farewell, agreeing to keep my departure discreet and to look out for my sons if needed. Meanwhile, Janet's neglect of household duties became apparent. The laundry piled up, and the overall upkeep of the house declined. Meals were hastily assembled, and our conversations lacked their former vitality. It seemed as if she was regaining the weight she had previously lost. In a mere four weeks, our world had descended into chaos. The following day, my sons excitedly handed me my maritime papers, their enthusiasm evident. Despite my insistence that they wait to make any decisions until completing the current term, it seemed as though they were already set on their course. Returning to the Osukamaru, I attended to all necessary arrangements for our upcoming voyage. The quartermaster provided me with a checklist of items to procure before our departure the following morning. After securing my gear and settling into my onboard quarters, I disembarked for the final time. Dylan had left his Triumph Bonneville 750 parked at the dock's end, ready for my journey to Aberdeen. An eight-hour motorcycle trip is hardly enjoyable. The constant shaking of the Triumph made it impossible to read the odometer, despite the smooth running of the engine and favorable weather conditions. Nonetheless, I was relieved when I finally arrived in Aberdeen. My friends had managed to locate Matthew Daniels and arranged for him to be at the Four Crowns. Access to the men's room at this establishment was through an exterior entrance at the back. After briefly signaling my presence to my companions inside, I positioned myself outside the building, awaiting Matthew's exit. As soon as he emerged, I seized his right arm and forcefully pressed his head against the stone wall of the building as we moved down the alleyway. His face scraped along the rough surface, and he stumbled in pain as I led him roughly about fifty feet before releasing him. His agonized moans mixed with cries of distress echoed in the dim light cast by the street. In the feeble illumination, his right eye socket appeared to be filled with blood, his cheekbone visible below his swollen eye, and his entire face bearing the marks of abrasion. Don't kill me, Michael, please don't kill me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Matthew pleaded, his voice trembling with fear. I had no intention of taking his life, but I saw no reason to reassure him of that. I'll give you a choice, Matthew. Tell me the truth about everything that happened at the party, and I'll let you live. Lie to me, and you die. Okay, okay. I'm hurting, Michael, he whimpered. Talk, damn it, and I'll get you a doctor. When Janet came into the party without you, Andrew got all excited. He started bragging about how he was going to get her loaded and sleep with her. She did look good, Michael. Honest. She was all dressed up and looked like she wanted to have fun. Andrew started, and he told us that we could have sloppy seconds. We didn't think he could pull it off. After a bit, he took her back to the storeroom, and we followed him. Are you sure you want to hear this, Michael? Yes, keep going. Ah, but don't hurt me anymore. When he was done, we too went to the room and did the same thing to her. She and Andrew left together, and I think they stopped someplace before he dropped her off. But I don't know for sure. That's it, Michael. I'm sorry. We didn't hurt her honest, and we didn't make her do anything she didn't want to do. I simply stared at him. Do you know where Andrew Beverly is? He shook his head, indicating a negative response. It was clear that he wasn't in a position to deceive me. His narrative aligned much more closely with Camilla's version of events than Janet's. I rapped on the locked pub door, exchanged greetings with a couple of old acquaintances, and then headed back to my motorcycle. A few miles down the road, I passed an ambulance racing toward the pub. It was early morning when I parked the Triumph at the spot where I had retrieved it and boarded the Osakamaru. Dylan would retrieve the bike later. My first shift was scheduled for that night, so I spent the remainder of the day recuperating from the grueling journey. That Dan motorcycle had really taken its toll on me. 
In hindsight, I should have opted for the car. I took a shower and grabbed some supper. My supervisor briefed me on my duties and then left me to my own devices. The job was entry-level and fairly straightforward. However, my fellow crewmates seemed less than welcoming. While they would respond to direct inquiries, they offered no assistance or camaraderie. It was evident that they were friendly with each other, but I found myself excluded from their circle. Despite this, I resolved to persevere and hope that things would eventually improve. Janet was likely served with divorce papers that morning, and I imagined Matthew Daniels had already divulged his version of events to the authorities. Meanwhile, my sons seemed to be finding some amusement in the unfolding drama. After my shift, I retired to my bunk. Two days later, I was called to the captain's office unexpectedly. Captain Costa appeared displeased as I stood before him. The Royal Navy has requested permission to land a helicopter on the Osakamarud to transport you back to the mainland. I received a detailed wire this morning justifying their request. I'll summarize some of the points outlined in the extradition request. If there are any inaccuracies, please clarify. I nodded silently, preparing to hear the summary. They wish to talk to you about the disappearance of a fellow named Andrew Beverly. You have charges against you for the beating of a man named Fred Gilmore so badly that he lost one kidney and might lose the other. You forfeited bail on that charge. You have charges against you for the maiming of a fellow named Alan Evans that was listed as self-defense, but is being changed because of the severity. Finally, on the night you boarded this ship, you beat a man named Matthew Timber in Aberdeen so bad that he lost his right eye. I don't know how the hell you could be here and in Aberdeen at the same time. And I don't want to know. It says here that all this mayhem was done with your bare hands to avenge a personal affront. Do you have any comments, Mr. Labert? Sir, I am sorry for any problems I might have caused you. I mean about the charges. Just that if I could have found Andrew Beverly, he would be in the hospital with the other three. I really don't know where that son of a bitch is. I'll pack my things and get ready for the helicopter when it arrives. Captain Costa just looked at me and smiled. That won't be necessary. I told them you never got aboard. There is no Michael Labert on the Osakamaru. Now get back to work. After the divorce was finalized and Janet lost the house due to my departure, I received a wire from my lawyer about the developments back home. Andrew Beverly was hospitalized with severe injuries, courtesy of my sons, Dylan and Nathan, who found him with Janet in our bedroom before the bail bond company reclaimed the property. Janet, pregnant and facing old issues, had relocated to Austell to live with her sister. Meanwhile, my lawyer advised against my return due to pending charges, and he had no information on the whereabouts of my sons. While these updates left me with mixed emotions, the next morning at breakfast, the captain delivered unexpected news. I just wanted to let you know that Dylan and Nathan Labert are not aboard the Tanakamaru headed for Cape Town. We both smiled. It seemed my destiny as a seafarer was finally coming to fruition. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.